If you were with us last week for Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and that was the first time you were here and you're back, welcome back. So glad that you're a chance to have a chance to worship with us. And if this is your church home, I'm just so thankful that you are leaning in to what God is doing in your life. Would you just keep doing that? Because that matters. It matters in your family. It matters in your place of work. It matters in your neighborhood. It matters in your church. Uh, we need each other, and you are a part of that. So keep it up. Keep, keep growing in the Lord. That is so important. Today, we're finishing the book of Luke, uh, the, at least the teaching in the gospel of Luke. And there are so many more things that we didn't get to discover together, but it was a great journey through. And today's the last day. And so what I want to do as we finish Luke is actually I want to start reading in the book of Acts. Because if you remember, the same author of the gospel of Luke is also the author of Acts. He's writing two different letters to a guy named Theophilus. And so he has a really good way of, of kind of wrapping up the book of Luke in the first part of Acts. So I want us to start there. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. If you have a Bible, you can open that up. It will be on the screen for you as well, but I invite you to open up Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading the first 11 verses, and we'll, uh, we'll see where that takes us today. All right, so here we go. In my first book... I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day he was taken up in heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Verse 4, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and then in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Verse 9, after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him, and they strained to see him rising into heaven. Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into the heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Now, as I think about this, this place that the disciples are in, I think about what's gone on. They've I'm trying to put myself in the disciples' sandals. What would they be feeling? What is it that they would be feeling right now? I think if I were them, I'd be feeling overwhelmed. I'd be feeling confused. I would feel uneasy and definitely lacking in confidence because the one who I was just with nonstop for the last three years who had the power to, re to restore sight to a blind man, casting out demons, walk on water, calm the storm, all these things is now gone. And I'm supposed to carry on with life. I would probably feel a little uneasy and probably not very confident on what was next. Because for the last three years, Jesus' disciples, Jesus was right there by their side. In fact, a rabbi and his students stayed very close, proximity, but also, I mean, they were, they were connected. And whatever the rabbi and the teacher was passing on to them, I mean, this was a very, very close relationship with teacher and student. And all these disciples, including others that were following, probably felt the same way. Who are, who's going to lead us now? Who's going to teach us now? Who's going to be our mentor Who's going to tell us what's next and where we're going and how we're going to do it? Who are we going to lean on when we're a little like, I'm not sure? 
Jesus is gone. That's why I think they would have laughed, lacked confidence. I know I, I feel like I would have. I would think that they, when they were with Jesus, they were like, dude, we can take on the world. But now that Jesus is gone, what are we going to do? And now Jesus left, just like, just like that. He's talking to them. Okay, guys, this is what you're going to do next. And they're like, okay, this is normal. Give us instruction. We know what we're going to do. All right, we're going to be witnesses. We're going to share this good news, and let's go. And then whoop, he leaves right there in front of him. He's, he's going. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, um, as Luke is writing it, I can picture them just kind of watching and watching and watching. Have you ever, have you ever let go of a helium balloon? And you kind of figure, how long can I see it, you know? There's always one person that can see it longer than everybody else. I'm not really sure if they're telling the truth. Like, do you really see it, really? Because I don't see it anymore. Yeah, it's that speck right there. Of course it's a speck, but I don't see it, you know? I kind of picture that. Like, they're just, and like, is he, and then all of a sudden, he disappears in the clouds, and then these angels tell him he's gone. Jesus leaves with no return date, no return time. The angels just tell him he's coming back. Luke tells us that Jesus had spent a brief time with his disciples after his resurrection. My question is this, was that enough time for them to fulfill the mission that Jesus had for them? I mean, he spent three years for them in the ministry they were currently doing, and then he shows up just a few times in this short amount of time, and he says, hey, you guys now go change the world, and then he leaves. Was that enough for these disciples to have the confidence and the mission to carry forward? Now, obviously, I'm asking a rhetorical question in some ways because here we are now, this side of all that, and it's obvious that they carried out their mission. We have writings of it. That's what the book of Acts is all about. But here we are, a part of God's church, still celebrating who he is as a living God, worshiping him, serving him. Our God is active. God is doing things in your life and in this church and in other churches. So yes, somehow they made it happen. But how? And as I read the details of Luke's letter, I find the answer. I find the answer. There are details in the the conversations and the time that Jesus had with his disciples that I find the answer that I'm looking for. And so what I want to do is I want to look a little bit deeper into the interaction between Jesus and his disciples in the last times that they were together. And so in order to do that, I want us to go back to two verses that we just read in the book of Acts. And when Luke is talking about this, he's actually referencing his previous letter in more detail. We'll read that. But here's what he said again in the book of Acts. This is verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1. He's talking about Jesus with his disciples. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus lets them know that in a few days, there's going to be a gift given to them and they're to wait for that. Have you ever ordered something uh, online and it tells you it's going to take three days to get there? And you can't, if, especially if it's something you're really looking forward to it, right? Whether somebody bought for you or you bought for yourself, you're waiting for this. And nowadays we can track the package. We know when it left the, the, you know, the postal center, we know it's in route and we, you know, and it's just, it's crazy. We can, we can have eyes on that thing the whole time. And here they are waiting for something they, didn't, they couldn't track exactly. They were just told to wait. Wait for a few days, and then you will receive this gift of the Holy Spirit that I've promised you, but I want you to wait for it. Now, Luke is referencing his previous letter. In these four verses, if you were to go back to chapter 24 of Luke, you'll find a little more detail on what he's talking about here. And I want us to do that. I want us to zoom in on Luke chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 39 and 49. Again, this is on the screen for you as well. So Jesus appears to his disciples after the resurrection, and he says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Now pause for a moment. Why would he say, look at my hands and look at my feet? You know it's really me. Because Jesus was just nailed to a cross. And if you were just nailed to a cross, your body is going to show signs that there are holes in your hands and in your feet. And so he's showing them, it's me. He says, touch me to make sure that I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still, 
they stood there in disbelief. I can only imagine. Filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, hey, do you guys have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate as they watched. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that every, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understanding the scriptures. And he said, yes, it is written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of the name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. I like that last little phrase. The power from heaven is going to indwell his disciples, his followers. Power from heaven. That's cool. Now, what do we learn about Jesus and his followers in these last days that Jesus was on earth? Well, we learn that Jesus appears to them several times in several different places to prove that he is risen. He appears in bodily form, and they actually get to see him, they get to talk to him, they get to touch his hands and his feet. We find out that Jesus gives them some final instruction. The instructions are, stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit, and you're going to preach because you're a witness of the things that you've seen and heard. Those were the final instructions. What else do we know? That Jesus ascended into heaven after being on earth for 40 days after the resurrection. And we find out that the angels tell the disciples that are standing there watching him disappear into the clouds that Jesus will come back just like he left. So in other words, Jesus will come back from heaven through the clouds. Now, here's four things that stand out to me about this text. Number one is this phrase, he ate as they watched. (laughs) That just kind of stood out to me, right? They gave Jesus some broiled fish. I mean, Luke's pretty specific in the kind of fish. It wasn't deep fried. It wasn't pan seared. It was broiled. We don't even know the kind of seasoning was used, but we just know how it was cooked. And they watched him eat. Now, sometimes I, I... This probably isn't the picture that Luke had in mind, what I'm thinking about. But I was thinking, they have all these followers, and Jesus asks them for food. And he starts eating in front of them. Number, there's, I think there's two reasons. The first reason is to show, show that he is in bodily form. Because if he's a ghost, if you ever watch those cartoons, when the ghost eats something or drinks something, it goes right to the floor, Right? <laughs> Okay, that would have happened if he wouldn't have been really there in bodily form. So I think first reason was to show that he is alive and alive people eat and it doesn't fall to the ground. The next reason, the next thing is because he's hungry. Think about how long has it been since Jesus ate? If he's resurrected in bodily form, then his body needs nutrition. That's what I, I mean, this is kind of makes sense to me, right? And I was kind of tracking like, when was the last time Jesus ate? Well, let's see, he was in three days, in the tomb, Friday on the cross, he didn't eat. it was Last Supper. It was Thursday night. And so I don't know what day this is. I didn't do the math on it, but he's hungry. And Jesus is showing. But here's here, what stands out to me more than it, it's because it says that he ate and they watched. I kind of get this idea of like, he's going, man, that's good. <laughs> Can I have some more of that? And they're all just going, He's like, are you going to eat that? And, you know, I kind of get this idea of like, he's just having a good time. Like, man, this is food. You're with me. Like, we used to do this. Remember? We used to do this. In fact, um, there's another one. This isn't a part of the, the teaching, preaching today, but there's another example of Jesus appears to him. It's the road to Emmaus. And they're, they're, they're talking and they don't recognize him. And then he sits down and he breaks bread with them. And all of a sudden their eyes are open. It's Jesus. I mean, it, they're like, oh, we've done this before. And all of a sudden, their eyes are opened, it's Jesus. Anyway, so that's the first thing that stood out to me. And there's really no like, theological implications or any other application other than that, was, that stood out. Like, oh, he ate, they watched. Okay, number two. Second thing that stood out to me was Jesus showed them something new. Luke says, 
then Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scripture. He opened their minds, which tells me this. They already knew the text. They already knew the Scripture. Jesus may have even said it before. But for some reason, Jesus decided to open up their minds to something new from something that had already been said multiple times. He opened their minds. I want you to think about this. Jesus spent three years with these guys. They spent three years with Jesus, listening under his teaching, influenced by who he was as the Son of God. And Jesus, after he rose again, decided to show them something brand new. He opened their minds to something new. Why? Why wait until after the resurrection to open their minds to something new? I think it's because he was about to lead them to ask them to do something new. See, he's now telling them, you're going to be my witnesses. I was with you. I want you to watch what I do, and I want you to, I'm going to show you how to do that, and now I'm going to leave, and now you're going to do this whole new thing without me physically here. I think that he was opening to something new because he was pointing them to something new. I look at this as a journey of growth for the disciples, a journey of commission. See, Jesus was continually, continually pouring into his disciples. From the moment they said, yes, I will follow you, Jesus spoke into their lives, taught them, molded them, guided them. He filled them with the knowledge of God when he was with them physically. And now... He's going to be gone physically, but he's going to give them his spirit. They would never lack anything when they're with Jesus. When Jesus says, I'm teaching you this, and now I want you to go out and do that, they would never lack in knowledge. They would never lack in power. They would never lack in competency as long as they listened and did exactly what Jesus asked for. And now Jesus is saying, now I'm going to ask you to do this, which is greater than what I was even asking you to do before. And I'm not going to be physically with you. But I'll still be with you. We'll talk on that in just a minute. And so Jesus waits till this time to show them something new. The other reason I think that Jesus waited until then to open their minds to something new was because they weren't ready for it before. I honestly believe that Jesus knew exactly what to reveal at every single day at that journey in his disciples' life. And if he would have shared with them, opened their minds three years before on what he opened their minds to that very day before he left, they wouldn't have been ready for it. They wouldn't have known what to do with that. See, our God knows us. He knows the journey of faith we're on. And I firmly believe that God opens our eyes as we walk and step with him to what we need to see and what we need to hear right when we need to see it, right when we need to hear it. But it's up to us to walk in step with him every day. I don't think God opens our eyes to everything all at once. I think that'd be a little overwhelming. Can you, can you imagine, if for those of you that have been Christians for a long, long time, can you... Can you go back to the day that that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe the day that he called you into some kind of ministry, or or just a pivotal day in your faith in Christ way back then? Can you, what if God gave you everything that he's given you up to this point all in that one time? Whoa, right? You're not going to catch it all. It's just too much. Because our God is, it's a journey with him. It's a journey of trust. It's a journey of of his faithfulness and our obedience. If he gave us everything all at once, then why would we need the Holy Spirit to walk with us every day? The disciples, the same thing. He opened their minds to something new because he had a new commission for them. And he said, now you're ready for this. So I'm going to give this to you because you're going to need this. I'm going to show you something. You know, there have been times in my own spiritual journey when I look back and I go, what was I thinking? Like, what happened? Why didn't I... How did I not see that? And what was, and then I realized, well, it's because God wasn't ready for me to receive that then. He has something for me today, something new today. I don't need to lean on yesterday's revelation and and what God is doing. I'm going to lean on today. 
God, I need you today. I want to walk in step with you today. You have a word for me today. You know, they call the Bible the living word. You know why they call it the living word? Because it's alive. And it will speak a new word to your heart, even if it's the same verse you read. How many of you can say, yeah, that's happened to me before? Yeah. God reveals new things to us because he's calling us to new things. But it's on us to say, Lord, I'm going to walk in step with you. I want to walk close to you. And then he empowers us. He fuels us. He charges us. He gives us. He encourages us. He lifts us up. He gives us something new when we need it. So keep walking in step. Tomorrow will be exactly what you need. If you're listening, he'll give it to you. The third thing that stands out to me in this text is that Jesus tells them that they are key players in the next step of God's plan. You're it. It's on you. I'm leaving. I need you guys to do this. You're key players in this. Something I noticed when I read this, I'm going to read this portion again. It's not on the screen, but this is in the Gospel of Luke where he said, Jesus said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of, these, of all these things. I don't know if you caught that, but Jesus started with the words, it was written. Now, when Jesus says the words, it was written, what is he doing? He's saying, these words have power. These words have, there's another word for it, oomph, right? These were, the, these, these are legitimate, credible words. It was written. Now, he states the obvious to give credibility to what was written. He says it was written, right, that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. They're seeing the it is written accomplished, He's like, it was written, and they're like, yeah, you're right there. Like, I see that it is written. That's true. But then he follows it up. I think Jesus did this to show them, like, hey, if this already happened, then guess what? The next is going to happen. It's also written that you will proclaim the authority of the name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And there's a forgiveness for the sins of all who repent. You are the witness to these things. You're a witness to right now what I'm calling you to do, and you're a witness to me when I'm gone. I love that. He says, you're going to be the preacher now. You are going to be a part of the it, and, it is written statement. God is entrusting you with the task of getting the message out to the world, but don't freak out yet because I'm asking you to do one step at a time. I'm going to have you start here in Jerusalem. You don't have to pack up your bags right now and go to the ends of the world. I want you to start right here in Jerusalem, and then you're going to go to Judea, and then you're going to go farther, and then eventually the whole world is going to know because of your faithfulness of one step at a time. I think God still works that way. I think God calls us to be a part of his kingdom work. He may give us a glimpse into that, but he says, just do one, one thing at a time that I'm asking you to do. And by the way, I'm with you. I love that Jesus doesn't leave the task here to chance or to human wisdom. He actually tells them very simply, he gives them specific instructions, what you're going to preach, how you're going to preach it, and who you're going to preach it to. What are you going to preach? You're going to preach the forgiveness of sins for all who repent. How are you going to preach that? You're going to preach that in the name of Jesus. Why is that important? Because that's where the authority lies, for the preacher and for the salvation of the hearer. And then the last thing, he just says, you're going to start here and you're going to end up out there. You're going to preach the good news of Jesus in my name and start right here. He gives them very specific instructions. Our God does that. When he calls us to something, he gives us those instructions. Now, sometimes he doesn't always give us exactly what those steps are going to be. We have to take steps of faith. God often is calling you to move into an area of ministry or calling you to go talk to somebody or calling you to be about something that you don't know. It kind of sounds scary. I mean, if I'm the disciple, he's like, you're going to go and preach to the whole world. I'm not sure about that. You know? 
I just fish. <laughs> like, I'm a fisherman. That's all I do, you know? And he's like, but don't worry, because I'll be with you. As followers of Jesus, this charge, this commission has never changed. You and I fall into the same commission of Jesus, to go and make disciples. It wasn't just for the first 12. It's for all followers of Jesus Christ to share in the good news. I really like how Paul says this. Paul, in his letter to the Corinth church, 2 Corinthians 5.20, he tells this to them. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So Paul gives us a different imagery here. He says, we are Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? When I was um, living in Paraguay as a missionary kid, I had some friends from my neighborhood that, whose parents worked at the embassy. I had one buddy whose dad was a, an ambassador from Honduras. Now, the reason that I was friends with them was because the Christian school that I went to, they were sent to that school. It was a Christian English um, private school, and a lot of times... Folks from embassies, that's where they sent their kids to school. And so I got to know these higher up people and their, and their kids. Um, across the street, uh, Tatiana's dad was an ambassador from Brazil. I knew these kids, and they would tell me that they had things called diplomatic immunity. They could get away with stuff because of who their dad and mom was. And I was like, what? That's crazy. And there, it was crazy. But basically, an Im- ambassador, like his dad, represented the country of Honduras in Paraguay. And he helped the rights of the Hondurians that lived in Paraguay. He helped maintain their rights as who they were from Honduras. And he was a representation of them in that country, in that foreign place. So Paul is saying, you are representative of Christ and where you go. And it might not even be your place. In fact, God is making his appeal through you. God is going to use you. This is what I find remarkable, that the almighty God wants to use you to proclaim to the nations that he loves them and he has a plan of salvation for them. Every one of us. You are Christ's ambassadors. Wherever you go, you are representing Christ. You are an example in your world of your place of work, in your neighborhood, whatever, who Christ is and the message that God wants you to come back to him. I like how the... um, Contemporary English version says, instead of an ambassador, it says, we were sent to speak for Christ. What if we all recognize that and like live that out, that I am sent? What, what he's saying is we're all missionaries in some way. We're sent. Now, the, the most important thing, and it's the last one that stands out to me in this text, is what we need to hear about this. And that is that Jesus really never left them. Now, hold on a second. You're like, wait a minute. We just talked about it. He went up in the clouds, and they, he disappeared, and then they're like, he's not here. He's coming back later on, but I'm not going to tell you when. That's the second coming of Christ. What do you mean he never really left them? Because he said, I want you to go, and I want you to wait, and God's Spirit will come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. When Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew that I'll never leave you, He meant what he said. When God gives his spirit to his disciples, that's the spirit of Jesus with him. If you think about it, it was a really, it's it's an amazing way that God is with his people. Because if Jesus would have stayed around, if he would have walked this planet and still done his ministry work, that would have been a little odd that 2,000 years later, there's a 2,000-year-old guy who's still the Messiah. It would have just been off a little bit. Like we, We probably would have had a hard time But Jesus knew that he's leaving, and now he gives his spirit to everybody who says yes to him. And so the spirit of Jesus is literally with us and in us anywhere we go. So the disciples are commissioned to go be preachers of this good news, and Jesus is literally with them as he guides them, and he's with us. Everybody who says yes to Jesus Christ is filled with his spirit. And that is how they had the confidence to even go to their death for the sake of the gospel because the power of Christ was in them through the presence of the Holy Spirit. We also receive that same Holy Spirit when we say yes to Jesus. 
And that same presence of God is with you, around you, and goes before you. And that's exactly why. You see, they had seen the power of God displayed in so many ways, especially through the resurrection of Jesus. They knew that it was amazing power. They knew that the power of heaven meant business. They knew that when Jesus said, I'll be with you and I'll fill you, that it was true, and they saw it with their own eyes. But blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. That's you and I. That when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we get a chance to be about kingdom work. And guys, it's still happening today. And so know that whatever God is calling you to, whatever new thing he's giving you to live out, that he's with you right there every single step of the way. And we don't have to fear because Christ is the victor and his spirit lives in each one of us. There may be some of you here today that recognize, I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I want to walk in step with that power. Can I just tell you that it's not a, it's not a magic uh, spell or it's not this, this magic formula that allows you to do that. It's a daily commitment to say yes to him. That's what it is. It's a daily continuing walk with him. But there may be some of you who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And today can be a day of salvation. You can say, you know, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to say yes to Jesus, and I want to walk in that way, and we want to invite you into that. And so if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's simply this, double A, B, C. The first A is acknowledge God loves you. The second A is admit that your sin distanced you from God. And then B is believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again. And then C, it's confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you'll be saved. And we want to invite you into that. And if you're an overflow here in the sanctuary and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're going to pray for you today. And so I'm going to ask everyone just bow your heads and close your eyes. If you know that today is a day where God is calling you by name for salvation, we want to pray for you. And I just want to know who I'm praying for. Would you just be bold to put your hand up and say, Pastor Rex, I want to ask Jesus into my life today. Is there anybody that wants to say yes to Jesus today? Just put your hand up and say, I want to, I'll pray with you today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else want to say yes to Jesus today? Now, I can't see you in overflow if you have your hand up. The Lord sees that. We have a hand up here in the sanctuary, and so we're going to pray right now. And so Pursuit Church, would you pray with this individual? Just repeat this prayer from your heart, and the church is going to pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your words to me. I know you love me, and I admit that I'm a sinner. I turn from my sin, and I walk towards you. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you rose again. Thank you for salvation today. You are my Savior. Thank you for this church and for this newfound faith. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise right now. Amen. Amen. Now, if you just gave your life to Jesus, you have a little bit of homework to do, okay? You need to tell somebody else that you gave your life to Christ. You can come talk to me, the people you came with. Just say, hey, today I made a decision to ask Jesus in my life. They're going to light up. They're going to be so excited. You're on this new journey of faith. We want to encourage you to do that. There's also a prayer team that's going to come up right now. Prayer team, if you want to come up, they're here to pray with you about a need in your life. Um, If uh, you just gave your life to Jesus and you need a Bible, you can talk to the person at at the Welcome Center as well. But we want to be on this journey with you. And so make sure that you make that known and we want to celebrate with you. Amen? And may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Love you. You are sent. Hey, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.